On that day, Jesus went out of the house and sat down by the sea. Such large crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat down, and the whole crowd stood along the shore. And he spoke to them at length in parables, saying, A sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seed fell on the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky ground, where it had little soil. It sprang up at once because the soil was not deep, and when the sun rose, it was scorched, and it withered for lack of roots. Some seed fell among the thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it. But some seeds fell on rich soil and produced fruit a hundred, sixty, or thirty-fold. Whoever has ears ought to hear. The disciples approached him and said, Why do you speak to them in parables? He said to them in reply, because knowledge of the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven have been granted to you, but to them it has not been granted. To anyone who has, more will be given, and he will grow rich. For, ev for anyone who has not, even what he has will be taken away. That is why I speak to them in parables, because they look, but they do not see and hear, but do not listen or understand. Isaiah's prophecy is fulfilled in them, which says, You shall indeed hear, but not understand. You shall indeed look, but never see. Gross is the heart of this people. They will hardly hear with their ears. They have closed their eyes, lest they see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their hearts, and be converted, and I and I heal them. But blessed are your eyes because they see, and your ears because they hear. Amen. I say to you, many prophets and righteous people have longed to see what you see, but did not see it, and to hear what you hear, but did not hear it. Hear then the parable of the sower. The seed sown on the path is the one who hears the word of the kingdom without understanding it. And the evil one comes and steals away what was sown in his heart. The seed sown on rocky ground is the one who hears the word and receives it at once with joy. But he has no root and lasts only for a time. When some tribulation or persecution comes because of the word, he immediately falls away. The seed sown among thorns is the one who hears the word. But then worldly anxiety and the lure of riches choke the word, and it bears no fruit. But the seed sown on rich soil is the one who hears the word and understands it who indeed bears fruit and yields a hundred or sixty or thirty-fold. Hello and welcome to Close Walk Catholic Communications. I'm Father Bayer, your host. We're glad that you can join us. The parable of the sower and the seed. It's as much about the world as it is about us. You've heard me say this many times, that nowadays, you know, when we in the history of the church talk about the Protestant Reformation that happened 500 years ago, there's a Protestant Reformation that happens every couple of weeks. You know, now there's more than 37,000 different Christian religions. We're all reading from the same book. And obviously what we're reading, what we're hearing, what we're understanding 
is vastly different. And so when we look at the world and we start to think about people who, in the name of religion, and some have done this, have made God in their own image and likeness. Years ago, uh, Sigmund Freud, the great German psychiatrist, happened to be Jewish. He raises a question, did God create man or did man create God? And being a German Jew, people were outraged and thought it was blasphemous. Very valid question. And when you look at 37,000 different interpretations of the same book, you have to realize there is some recreation of God that's going on. And our Lord uses the parable of the sower and the seed to talk about the different conditions of the world and how we respond, how we react, and how we bring the scriptures to our own liking. You know, you have to ask yourself a basic question. What's the purpose of religion? Why do we have religion? And some people nowadays will say, religion is nothing more than a source of uh, controversy and division and all religions ought to be banished. And the, the John Lennon song, Imagine, Imagine There's No Religion, you know, and, and, and that sort of thing. And the reality is, is I don't know if religion or the Word of God or adherence to the Word of God is what causes divisions or if it's different peoples Matter of fact, 37,000 different people's interpretation of what God is asking of us. So he goes out and he said, you know, he goes out to sow the seeds. And some fell on the path and the birds came and ate it up. Okay. I, I oftentimes am taken aback when someone will walk up to me and say, am I saved? I'm working on it. I don't know that I'm saved. I've got a sinful human nature. And tomorrow, I can make the decision to do something that would separate me from God for all eternity. Now, in order not to do that, I need to remain faithful to God. I need to pray to God. I need to trust in God's grace. But when someone asks me, am I saved? I don't really know how. Do I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and the Savior of the world? Yes. Have I been baptized? Yes. Have I been confirmed by the Holy Spirit? Yes. Have I lived my life perfectly according to the law of God? No. Do I try to? Yes. Do I have a long way to go? Yes. Will I get there before I die? No. Will I, do I hope that God sees me trying when I die? Yes. And so that idea of salvation, of being you know, rather simplistically, all you need to do is confess Jesus on your lips and you'll be saved. You know, that's like saying, all you had to do was stand up at your wedding and say, I do, and you're going to live happily ever after. You know, that didn't happen. You said, I do, and then you started doing it. And some days you did it very well. 
and some days you fail miserably at it. And some days you thought it was on the rocks, and other days you thought it was as strong as it could ever possibly be. But just saying something doesn't mean anything until we start to live it. And we live it every day for the rest of our lives. And some days we're very successful. Some days we're just miserable. But we have to do it. We have to keep doing it. And that's the invitation. So when I, when, when I think, you know, I hear people, they've gone to a prayer meeting, they've gone to a revival, they attended a church, they accepted an altar call, and they said, yes, I accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior. That's wonderful. That took all of 30 seconds. Showing and living your acceptance for Jesus as your Lord and Savior is what you will do for the rest of your life based on that profession of faith. Some seed fell on rocky ground and had little soil. Well, the soil is where we ground ourselves. And where we ground ourselves is in increasing our knowledge, increasing our desire, increasing our love, and working on a daily basis to make that statement that I accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior. Make that the way I live my life not just on Sundays or on Wednesday evenings or when I'm around my religious friends, whether or not that statement has ground and fertile soil depends upon what we do after that. When I stand at the altar and say, uh, in sickness and in health for richer and poorer until death do us part, I'm going to love you, then that's not a one-statement deal. That's an everyday reality that we work on. So is faith. When we get married and th think we can still act like we're single, we can still have our own friends, we can still have our own girlfriends, we can still do happy hour. We can still go out to the bars. We can still take trips by ourselves and just doesn't work. Doesn't work in married life, and it doesn't work in religious life. It's what we do for the rest of our lives, and it's creating that foundation in our life. The words are the start. The actions are your life's work. We're going to talk more about that when we come back. Stay with us. Hi, I'm Father Jeff Bayou from Closer Walk Catholic Communications. Thank you for being here today, and a special thanks for the support that you give us. First of all, your prayerful support we so desperately need, and also your financial support. We are donor-driven, and that is what keeps us on the air today. As you well know, the truth is in great demand and in very short supply, and mainstream media is not going to bring you the truth of the Gospels of our Lord Jesus Christ because that's not socially acceptable and it's not politically correct. Certainly we all realize that when this life journey's over, we don't stand before the Supreme Court, we stand before the throne of God. Therefore, with great clarity and great charity, to pronounce the truth of the Gospel is important. Your prayers, your financial support enables us to do that. So we thank you, and may God bring you closer in your walk with the Lord each day. God bless you. This is why I speak in parables, because they look, but they do not see. They hear, but they do not listen or understand. Isaiah's prophecy is fulfilled, which says, you shall indeed hear and not understand, 
You shall indeed look and never see. Gross is the heart of the people. They will hardly hear with their ears. They've closed their eyes, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and be converted and I heal them. Hello and welcome back to Close Walk Catholic Communications. I'm Father Bayer, your host, and we're, we're, we're glad to join you. We're talking about the sower and the seed, and we're talking about, you know, thanks for the ice cream cone. I just don't get it. And we're talking about the people who, you know, can walk around and they can quote scripture like they just swallowed the New Testament, but somehow their words and their actions don't go together. Now, trust me, uh, I wish I could say every thought, every word that comes out of my mouth, I am totally committed to, I'm not, I'm not. And when it comes to hypocrites, I'm in line, but I'm trying and I'm working on it. At least I know it's hypocritical. At least I know that the Lord ex expects more of me than what I actually give. And like I said, the day I die, I'll be far from perfect, but I pray God, He'll look at me and say, this guy died trying, you hear? I mean, he really gave it his best shot. And so we, we come back. Some fell on rocky ground where it had little soil. It sprung up, but then the sun came and scorched it. You know, and that's the idea. And, you know, and, and I say this all, all the time, that the minute the door slams in a prison and your last appeal is exhausted in court, everybody gets religion, okay? And now they want Jesus to save them, and now they, they finally got religion. One of the prisons I was at, I thought I was doing a great job. They, they had one of the inmates who'd go around to all the cells, <clears throat> excuse me, and he had a library. Well, I got the, new, the Bible Society to donate 200 new Bibles for me. I put them on the Zuzu cart that was going around with library books and Bibles, and I was going to pass them out to the inmates that way rather than carrying this stuff with me all day long. Come to find out that they stopped the guy because he was demanding sexual favors in order to give him a Bible. Well, thank you. I don't think he really, <clears throat> he really didn't get that one, okay? And so it's about really not, you know, like I said, you don't get the point. It's not that easy. Some fell on rocky ground and had a little soil. Well, you know, uh, great, you know, but I, I, I got religion and then I got with my friends who liked to party. And I got back to my old habits. And I got back to smoking and sniffing and snorting everything I did before. But I really believe that Jesus is my, is my savior. Well, okay. You know, uh, can, can an addict have faith? Yes. As a matter of fact, the first step in addiction is to recognize and acknowledge that without God, I'm powerless, okay? They call it a higher power. But don't think just because you told Jesus you love him, he's fine with you snorting and sniffing. I had a, I had a classmate I grew up with, and long story, I met her in New Orleans. She was turning tricks for a living, and she had track marks all up her arm, but she had gotten into the Bible, and she realized that because the stuff she was injecting came from poppy seeds, and it was from nature, and God created nature, then it was okay for her to do that. Ah, uh, thanks for playing, but I don't think we caught on, okay? And it's that type of uh, understanding where there's very little soil and we can justify what we want to justify. And we can also 
but become very judgmental. I was I was telling someone that who was in the studio with me on, on break. I was working at a prison, and the warden's brother, who's a big Baptist, came in, and we were there having dinner, and I got up and I helped him. I'd met him many times before. I'm Catholic, he's Baptist, and, and after fixing his supper for him, he looked at me and he said, you know, I'm not going to mind you being in heaven with me one bit. And I'm thinking, oh, <laughs> that's mighty big of you, okay? Uh, no one has given me the pass key to get to heaven yet. I'm still working on it by the way I live my life. But it's that type of uh, lack of soil. Just to, you know, yeah, you know, I know it. I know it up here, but it doesn't get much further than that. And then it said, some seed fell among thorns and grew up and it was choked off. You know what I think about with that? I think about the many kids who've come through my school of religion. And they're really good kids. They got involved in the youth group. You know, and they were very involved, and they had faith, and they did the retreats, and they went through confirmation, and they were really, really good kids. And they got to college, and in college, they had all sorts of opinions thrown at them. They had a whole lot of people who started challenging them. They had learned enough about their faith to practice it, but not enough to explain it. And perhaps that's our fault. Perhaps that's the fault of religious education. Perhaps that's the fault of families and educating their children. Everyone wants them to get advanced degrees and great educations, but equipping them with the a knowledge of our faith and an understanding of our faith and why we do it and why we believe it and why we practice it. A lot of people don't have it. I'm going to do a little commercial here. There is a priest that I did a show with many years ago titled Father Mario Romero. And Father Romero had written a book called Unabridged Christianity. And it's basically a book of apologetics. Why do you pray to saints? Why do you honor Mary? Why do you call a priest father? All the things that a lot of our young people and even some adults are getting choked off. The ways of the world are choking them off and they can't understand it. And so my commercial is, and I think it's Queenship of Mary Publishers. Father Mario Romero wrote a book called Unabridged Christianity. And he goes from the early church fathers to the early church, to the scriptures, and to the way our beliefs have developed through the years and why we believe them and why we practice them. And I'm going to really recommend that. As a matter of fact, in my parish, we use it for our CIA because when people who come from other religions, you know, say stuff like, where do you find the word sacrament in the church? Where does it talk about the Vatican in the church? Why do you pray to Mary? And why do you have statues? It says, have no false gods before me and all the different things that we get choked off. Why? Not because we're not teaching the truth, but because of many people go through life just accepting, never questioning, and they meet either people who are aggressively atheist <clears throat> or in many, many ways aggressively anti-Christian, a Catholic, and they don't have a good explanation, and so they fall by the wayside. Their lack of knowledge allows them to be choked off. <coughs> also, what happens is they get caught up 
in the world of fun. You know, every one of us has dark moments in our mind. I'm not going to tell you mine. That's my business, okay? But we all have dark moments. You get out on the Internet and you get out on college campuses or you get out into the party scene, you're going to find a group of people to do everything you want. You'll find a group of people who believe this is fine, a group of people who believe that is fine, a group of people who believe that's all wrong. And you can say, you get to the point where you say, everybody does it. You know, <coughs> everybody lives that way. Everyone believes it. Everybody does drugs. Everybody's very liberal with their, their sexual uh, uh, ideals and everything. Everyone's promiscuous and there's nothing wrong with it. They do it and they're good people and this, that, and the other. That's what chokes us off. And speaking of choking, give me a minute. That's how the world chokes off many people who go out unprepared. And if you've been in that situation where perhaps you've left your Catholic faith because a lot of people challenged you and you didn't know what to say, get that book, Unabridged Christianity by Father Mario Romero. And then our Lord talks about those who fall on deep soil. You know what? Catholic schools, CCD, Sunday sermons can do only so much. If you've spent all this money all your life on Catholic school tuition and figured that was going to give your child faith, it's not. That's going to give your child information. You're going to give them faith by the way that you live your life, by the way that you live your faith, by the way that you explain your faith as you pass it on to the next generation. And it's those people who receive faith in the home or receive faith through some type of mentorship. They're the ones who produce 30, 60, and 90 fold. We're called to use our eyes to open, to see, use our ears to hear, and use our hearts to love God and testify to our faith. We thank you for being with us. May each day bring you closer in your walk with the Lord. God bless. Thank you.